George Lucas's Star Wars saga has appealed to four generations of viewers since it launched in 1977. The signature look of the Star Wars used universe is the work of set decorator Roger Christian, working with designer John Barry. How this innovative look was created is revealed for the first time in the new documentary, Galaxy Built on Hope. Roger, you won a well-deserved Academy Award for the creation of the used universe, and it all started with this adapted submachine gun. As set deck, I had to come up with all the weapons. There was no budget to set up a special department to make any of the props or guns. And I thought, you know what? That looks pretty cool, and I, I love the Sterling, the look of it. it. To me, it was a science fiction gun as well, if it, I'd adapted it correctly. That was my pet peeve, mm -hmm. weapons that felt too light in the actor's hands and they're trying to pretend, and that's heavy. That is very heavy, it feels real. I wanted to find something that would suit a kind of tall, hairy Chewbacca. Star Wars is about taking something real, something timeless, and just giving it a little spin adding like 10, 20% science fiction to it. I was always intrigued by this fascinating shape and I wondered about its origins. It's a Fijian to Tokyo Warriors Club. I wanted to do what I always did to everything on Star Wars, add something into it. I was in the ticket office where I had all my graphics cameras and one day um, Roger Christian walked in. I brought out a graphics handle. I knew I'd found the Holy Grail. Okay, how do I turn this into what I feel would be a lightsaber? So this is the toolbox. There's his initials, William J. Harmon. The whole of the land speeders and R2-D2 were all made out of this little box and the bits that we found in the studio. So I went round scrounging wood from the other productions that were hanging around. The one in Metropolis only walked forward three paces and George tells me that they wanted it to do a lot more and it, they, it couldn't. Ralph McQuarrie had painted C-3PO with illuminated eyes. This was my biggest problem. I'd come up with this idea of using aeroplane junk and other scrap, I could stick it into the sets and make it work. Roger was highly imaginative in that respect and saved us an awful amount, a huge amount of money. Han Solo's Millennium Falcon felt like a Camaro in some kid's garage. People could identify that. I want to get my car, I want to fix it up, I want to get out of this small town. That's the sentiment that was going on. You added those animals and vehicles outside the cantina entrance. Well, George was always saying that he wanted a spaghetti western in space. John had done a sketch with the bones on the dunes. I found a full-sized fiberglass skeleton of a dinosaur. I had them sent straight down to Tunisia. But we crest the dunes, and I looked down into this valley, and there are the fiberglass dinosaur bones that you left there 20 years earlier. My first piece from David was a piece of nondescript material that was some part of the crate dragon. The Jawas roamed the deserts, picking up anything they could find to repair and sell. The scene was supposed to start with my astromech robot being lowered down from the sand crawler, but it took so long that George started the scene with R2-D2 coming down the ramp. So Roger, one of the things I admire is the fact that you guys cannibalized existing things, making a lightsaber out of a camera parts and the salvage model parts for the Millennium Falcon. What can you illuminate about that? Go back to the very beginning and trace the origins of Star Wars in Roger Christian's Galaxy Built on Hope. All right, guys, so very excited, Michael, for our next guest. And Jens, thank you so much for you know making the connection. We're really excited to to have this next guest on. Right, Michael? Oh. Yeah, so so it's very rare that I get giddy, and I know Gabe's very giddy, but yeah, so Jens, we really appreciate you uh, making the connection. I know you've been uh, working with this guy as an editor on your, the magazine. And it was really great that we were able to reach out to him, you 
and then have him on. But, you know, Gabe, this is such a big honor through Collection Wars. We have so many great industry guests, as our community knows. And, you know, we, we've hit the realm of the studio scale. We've hit, you know, the creature effects side of things. But, you know, it's not very often that, that it's talked even on other channels about prop masters and what the role play is. Yeah. And to be able to have an iconic gentleman like Roger Christian is such a huge honor. And just, you know, we've heard these stories, right, Gabe, about, you know, seeing these photos of R2 before he was created and then, you know, how it all came together. But we're going to be talking to a gentleman that did it all. Really? <laughs> I mean, uh, he is a, in the, in the prop world, right? Which is kind of mm. like my realm. I, I, I love mm. the weapons. I love lightsabers. He is literally the godfather of Star Wars props. And it's, I mean, it's, it's a truly, truly an honor to have him on. So For sure. um, I think let's, let's bring him on. Please. Please. Hello, everybody. <laughs> hey, Hi, Roger. Roger. <laughs> How are you? Good. Thank you. I made, made it back. My son's a soccer mad, so I had to go and do soccer practice with him. So Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for jumping on with us, Roger. It's it's truly an honor. Um, really, I mean, it's it's such a such a pleasure to have you on and, and be able to, to chat with you about all this cool Star Wars stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I inherited the legacy, so I'm the only one who knows all the stories. So yeah, I guess I'm duty bound to. Um, <laughs> And I know we'll talk. I know we'll talk about it, Roger. Your book and all, but I, I'll. I'm so grateful what you have done um, in putting that together because the stories would never be told if it wasn't for you, Roger. You know, it's it's just incredible stuff. So. Yeah, no, it's you know John Barry and I, and John Barry, the designer who died of meningitis when he was working on Empire, sadly, yeah. was just yeah. a genius a wonderful human being and a dear friend and a dear friend to george but so i'm the only one who um was in the kind of hot seat making everything even john didn't know really what i was doing because <laughs> we had no money so i had to invent ways to do things in a different way and fortunately we had a director who made thx as an independent yeah. got stuff made <laughs> in the streets and converted kind of la into a science fiction world so he knew what we were doing absolutely yeah. well, roger i think i before we jump into yes talking about your work and everything um i, I we want to know a little bit about you just even before you got into the industry what 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 really drove you into the to the film industry how did you get involved uh early on um it there wasn't this childhood because we had, I think there was a Saturday morning sinner. I dragged my mother to um, every Saturday, but th there was only kind of came about through kind of a Holy Grail moment. I was, um, I was so broke because I had no support at home and I was putting up tents, marquees all over the South of England and we were putting them up one day and I saw this prison camp being built in this um, kind of edge of the forest and I went across and said what are you guys doing and they said well we're building this camp and I said well it's real what what's going on and they said no yeah there's an old um, homeless guy gives, comes past every day and gives us food he thinks we're prisoners but it's for a movie um, for Pinewood Studios they're just through the woods there so the next day at lunchtime which we got off I went got under the fence because I couldn't get in found a way <laughs> borrowed my way and they were shooting um what the james bond i think probably the first one wow and the, and the set doors were open and i saw this kind of world that i knew nothing about and the smell and the lights and what was going on and i went in the prop room mm -hmm. and it was must have been goldfinger because there were gold bars everywhere and i was picking them up and thinking well these are just made of plaster but they look real i got to be part of this and um a few weeks later, my mate at art school had bought this old Jaguar Mark Seven for fifty pounds. Wow. We we thought we were kings. We 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 drove to London to watch Doctor Zhivago in the big London cinema, and it's the first time I'd been in a 
auditorium and it had happened to me when I was young. I actually had an out of body experience. I left my body when they were burying, um, Zivago was a young kid and they were burying the father and the wing was rising and all the, the tr leaves blew off the trees and this music, I just left my body. Yeah. And I managed to come back in again and I thought, that's it, this is it. I got to get in this industry. And that took me years to get in. I wrote letters, no one would reply. Mm -hmm. Somebody did reply, a producer in Pinewood Studios who said, look, you, you've been to art school, you really need architecture. And I, I don't know how, but I got into Oxford School of Architecture, mm -hmm. did two years there. And then the principal gave me principal gave me my um, diploma and he said, Roger, you, you should go and do what you really want to do now. I know what he, I knew him very well. So by serendipity, I ran out of money. <laughs> I was hitchhiking a lift home in Maidenhead, having sold the car. The man who picked me up was an architect who got, I got talking to and he said, oh, I, I remember one of my guys worked on Cleopatra and it, it was such a huge film. They were hiring draftsmen from all over the country. And um, he said, I'll hook you up with him. And he did. He made an appointment for me to go and see this designer, Charlie Bishop. And I went to see him at EMI Studios and Charlie was doing a TV series, very cult famous, uh, Department S. He was just finishing and he said, I can't take you on, but I would. He looked at my folder of work and he said, but I've made your appointment at Shepperton, so go down on Thursday. I went down and I met John Box, who designed Dr. Zhivago and wow. Lawrence of Arabia. And um, he, I, I think he was the one who kind of launched me because he looked at my folder all this work I had and everything. And he closed it up. He said, listen, let me tell you about the film industry. You're in the desert. You've got an airplane next to you. You've got a bottle of green ink in your pocket. There's a cloud of dust. The director arrives and the producer going, wow, this is great. Can you have that airplane read by tomorrow morning? <laughs> and you either talk your way out of it or you do it. <laughs> wow. It's held through all of my kind of, career and he mentored me because I came out with hair down my shoulders and Cuban boots and, and everyone else in the art department were in suits and ties and short hair saying you've got to knuckle down boy you've got to <laughs> you know you've got to be serious if you want a job and yeah. I would have none of it and I wasn't even allowed out I used to sneak out to go and see the sets because the Oliver was the film we were making, and, and John Box, the designer, he, his sets for the canals were unbelievable, the reality and the aging, and I would go and watch, and then I'd be sent back and threatened to be fired. But John Box looked after me, mentored me, and um, stopped me from being fired, and I eventually got on the drawing board and drew up the canal set and other things, and then Charlie Bishop offered me the job and I set decorated um, Randall and Hopkirk Decease, which became a huge cult TV series. And that was it. I was off and running. Uh -huh. And um, it kind of, I did a lot of independent films. I worked with some very innovative designers, always as an art director, and um, some really cool stuff. Final program. I don't know if you've ever seen this crazy film that um, was a Michael Moorcock book. Hmm. about a British detective who had needle guns and only ate chocolate McBitty biscuits. <laughs> no, I don't know about and, that. Oh, it's a cool movie. The great book. Michael Moorcock was a really, you know, interesting science fiction writer. But, I mean, I worked my way up until I got the call to go to Mexico on Lucky Lady. Um, hmm. And it was a massive film. I mean, really massive for its day. No. And I got called in because there were only three in the art department and we had 52 boats fighting on the ocean. It was rum running in the 20s. Yeah. So I turned up and took over the kind of dressing and um, by chance and serendipity, Gloria Willard Hike had written Lucky Lady and it was a brilliant script. They wrote American Graffiti yeah. and they wrote without credit, some of the dialogue from character stuff for George on Star Wars. And then when Alan Ladd chose 
George Lucas because none of the studios were functioning well. They weren't getting an audience, so one chose Spielberg, one took Coppola. Mm -hmm. um, he took George Lucas, who turned in <laughs> with the worst nightmare, yeah. saying, I want to do a children's science fiction fantasy, which yeah. had no box office. So um, they all explained to me that um, they estimated it would make $12 million. And at that time, they would divide it by three. And they told George, we'll make your film if you can do it for $4 million. Well, Gary Kurtz had budgeted at eight. In Britain, we were exactly half the price at the time. Oh. And we had stages free because it was pretty bad, the film industry, and there were none free in America. So that Gloria and Willard said, you've got to come and meet John and Roger. They're doing what you wanted. They're doing a spaghetti kind of period film. We're converting old Mexican buildings. And um, yeah. George turned up with Gary. We were like students, honestly, all of us. Yeah. We looked like students. And um, I was <laughs> shoveling salt for a salt factory I was building. There was an action scene. And George, being who he is, he picked up a shovel and said to me, I want to make this science fiction film. And I, I, I was quite honest. I said I'd never related to any movies. And I, I was an avid science fiction reader. Mm -hmm. um, and I said I just didn't believe them. They're all over-designed. Guns don't work. I mean... And he said, no, I'm trying to do a spaghetti Western. So my words to him were, look, I think it should be like an old car in a garage that's been repaired by the owner and kept going and repaired and dented and everything. So only when I read the script, when we got to London, I realized I'd exactly described the Millennium Falcon. Falcon. Uh, so John Barry was the first one hired, and I was the third one hired because he, he took... Um, Jeffrey Unsworth, the DP, who sadly was too busy to do it. Yeah. And that was it. I was on. That was it. Man, that is so cool. So can you can you describe some of, you know, obviously you, you start working on Star Wars. What was kind of one of your, the first task that you were, you were given? Well, we, we ended up being presented with this budget when I did my breakdown and John did, and it was impossible to do. So we had to think about how to do it. Gary Kurtz was struggling to get the budget down. So Fox wouldn't commit. There was no money. So George on his own money, we mm -hmm. took a tiny studio in London and we were four months. There was just Gary and George and myself and John Barry and one art director, Les Dilly. And the first thing that we kind of realized was that if r2d2 didn't work <laughs> george said another film and there was no cgi in those days didn't exist mm -hmm. and um, the radio control was really primitive yeah. so we knew actually because of doctor who and the daleks we knew that if we could get someone inside him yeah, And we measured his exact height from Ralph Macquarie's paintings because we had six of his paintings. And mm -hmm. actually there, he's the unsung hero of Star Wars. Everything was in those paintings. Yeah, um, And we found Kenny Baker. And my, I hired this carpenter who made all the Monty Python films. And if you ever watch Holy Grail, they couldn't even afford horses. They were so low budget. They had to have coconut shells banging. And um, so Bill had some wood at home in his garage, which he brought in because <laughs> Robert Watts was on. Yeah, there it is. So we, we made this kind of tube and the legs built it. He was very clever around Kenny Baker because we'd found him and he was three foot eight and we knew we could get it under four feet. And that top, I was scrounging in the back of the light store and found this top in the junk. Um, so I sent Bill to buy it because they'd have charged me too much as a set decorator and he got it for 10 shillings. Yeah. And um, I bought some scrap pieces for nothing. And one of them is the light nozzle from a Dakota. Mm -hmm. which has stayed for this day. And you see, Bill then said, because he said I couldn't make the top, so that fitted. Mm -hmm. See the little hands in the front? That one 
Bill said, I can't do that. So um, he sent me home with a pen knife and a bit of balsa wood, and I carved that at home. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And I stuck all these things in, which have stayed to this day. And we actually, kind of the most auspicious moment on Star Wars, we couldn't get him to move it. So we, we got his boots and stapled those in the bottom of the feet. Mm -hmm. um, he still couldn't move it. <laughs> and with the bits of junk that I'd got, there was a fighter pilot's harness. And we stapled it inside. And Kenny could put it on like a rucksack he could take the weight of it and he actually walked three steps wow, wow. And george was there in gary and and us and we knew then we had a movie yeah and at the same time i i knew i, I had so little money for the budget i knew i couldn't um i couldn't make it so i thought you know what I, i've always had a big issue with guns so i'm going to use real guns and i i went to I didn't tell George or John Barry, nobody. I just went to the gun hire place who were friends of mine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could, you could arm, they armed Gandhi. I mean, they could do huge movies there. And um, I love the Sterling submachine gun. I would have used it as it is. I just think they're like a sci-fi weapon. Mm -hmm. But um, I got my buyer to get me some T-strip and I stuck it round. And then digging around in Baptist, I found all these beautiful gun sites, the, these uh, telescope sites that they used in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I stuck those on the top um, and I, I stuck that, that one and I took out the clip because Sterling's have a big clip on the side for a lot of bullets in war and I, they had one little one so I put that in and then I kept thinking, you know what, George keeps saying that Han Solo's a, a cowboy, a western hero so I found the Mauser which I thought, wow, this is a Western space gun. So, again, I stuck the similar sights on the top, and I, I wanted to change the shape of the barrel, and I found a little flash excluder that hid the flash, stuck that on the front, and thought, okay, I've got two. I better call George over. And either I'm on the right track or I'll get fired. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, that was it. George stayed with me, and we made Princess Leia's gun together. He, he and I were getting covered in super glue, but that's how right. it started. Here's Princess Leia's right here. Yeah, yeah, that George and I made that together in the gun hire place. We found oh, the bits and so stuck cool. them on. So, Roger, were you uh, at that time, point in time, were you familiar with weapons and guns and stuff, or yeah. was it a, were you did you were you able to walk into a big prop area where that had guns like World War II guns, because I yes. noticed that a lot of the the stuff that has been used is from World War II and, and follows yes. this. Yeah, they were called Baptists. They were the only one. You could, you could if you wanted to do a World War II movie, they could do any size of army, anything. And I knew, see, we rented the guns. We didn't have to buy them. And I, I knew I couldn't go to the studios and make them like the usual where you design something and it goes through the process. I knew we didn't have time or the money to do that, so I could rent. I dug around and found that bowcaster, oh, yeah. che Chewbacca, and I, I took it that one to George because um, Ralph McQuarrie had him with a, a, a blaster. Mm -hmm. And I said, this would look better. And, and George, yeah, he, he agreed. And he changed the script on that one. The, wow. There were all treasures in there. I, I, there was a beautiful old samurai uniform, mm -hmm. all black, glossy, and it was exactly how I imagined uh, the Darth Vader's helmet. So we took that into the studio, and that became a, a kind of reference point for how to get mm -hmm. that kind of texture on him. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I knew I could rent as many as I wanted, Sterling submachine guns. I, I could rent anything. Um, and so that became really a kind of way out of the budget that I knew it could be done and it wasn't difficult. And also the big thing when we started, they could all be on single shot. So we got the flame and a bit of smoke each time. The problem was when we started actual shooting, they kind of they come out left-handed, so the the shells were hitting the other stormtroopers. So uh, they had to they had to stop. They were worried they were going to get um, hurt. Burn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. 
man that that is that's awesome and yeah all these iconic you know blasters obviously the what we referred to you know han solo's gun right the dl44 yes. you know obviously the stormtrooper blaster the han, i mean all of them you you create yeah. i mean that that's that is fantastic yeah, and some of them, it's in that documentary, some of them, I got Baptist to come, you, you can't go there anymore, it's not mm. allowed by the government, they're secret, I couldn't film the outside, I couldn't go inside, nothing, they're so worried about terrorists now, Yeah. but wow. they brought a lot of the guns to me, to where I was shooting in London, so, you know, there are huge guns that stormtroopers could carry into the Millennium Falcon when they go in and things like that, so that you get a different kind of feeling for them. Yeah, um, I just liked the look of them. I never knew what it was or where it was, you know, used or what its name and number was. And now I know because the, yeah. the fans have found out. But um, um, at the time, whatever looked right, and, yeah. and everything on Star Wars, I changed it a little bit, like the the gaffy stick. Yeah, which uh, is now iconic. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, wow, okay, because I was being very careful, like. They were, you know, they're desert nomads, so they wouldn't have like a beautiful blasters that would have the, um, the Death Star and the um, Empire would have. So I found the gaffy stick, and that's, that's a mace at the end of it that Baptist made for medieval films, and I drilled out the end and stuck it in the end. So I just changed it a little bit. Yeah. It's great now to see this now so celebrated in the Boba yeah. Fett. Oh, yeah. Well, in fact... <laughs> In fact, Roger, I, I know, you know, and I'll, I'll bring this up, but like, I know just recently um, they made a replica. Yeah, I got you. I did. Oh, you did. You know, yes. That's your autograph right here. Oh, right. I actually got it right here. You got one? Yeah, I got I got one right here. Oh, there you go. Big old robot. I know. I want one of those. I'm going to ask them. Oh, yeah. No, they got to they get you one of these. Yeah. I mean, it's fantastic. It's, it's yes. metal. Um. Because I'd love to bring that out when I do events and stuff. So. Oh, well, Tommy, yeah. you know, we'll make it. Yeah, we'll 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 definitely uh, bring that up. Yeah, with with Tom, they definitely gotta, yes. they gotta get you one. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, Christian, I'll, I I mean, Roger, I want to show you um some pictures. Um, just kind of and just you know maybe it'll spark up some memories yes. and just kind of you know just bring it up. Um, now one of these, you, you sent this one and I want to show you this. <laughs> now, what can you tell us about this? So I was, so I, I'd, I'd worked out the guns and, um, I, I couldn't work out how on earth I was going to make the Millennium Falcon, the interiors and, and of the exterior of it. Um, and I was driving around London, kind of scratching my head. And one day I thought, well, you know what? I'm finding bits of scrap. Why don't I get scrapped aircraft parts? Yeah. And I kind of, a bit of trepidation. I went into George and uh, John, uh, to, to John Barry mm -hmm. and said, listen, I got an idea. If I got airplane scrap when we got it all broken down i could dress the sets and i could make it look like a submarine in space and the, and they said yeah fine go and do it mm -hmm. so the film only triggered um right before christmas and we went into the studio in january of 75 and um robert watts said look we found the airfields mm -hmm. the right where there are four big industrial airfields for for um planes and they seem to have scrap yards and i flew in this little tiny plane mm -hmm. with three of us we went round and the first one honestly i there was this mountain of airplane junk no one wanted it there was rolls royce endings that were piles and we bought so much it was like 50 pounds no one wanted it <laughs> so yeah. each place i went to we bought more and more and more um and it's just another story it's kind of funny but um most of the crew i think it's well known now thought it was a pile of crap and they, they none of them appreciated george they, they were really against us i was with george and so was john yeah no it was awful I, i'll tell you 
how tell, it, us. tell us how it came when we moved into the big studios in Boreham Wood. They asked me to put on a table all of the guns I'd made. We had R two D two. We had everything we'd done so far to show them. Right in they come, the first AD, the big prop guys, everybody all came in, looked, picked up my Sterling submachine gun, literally threw it at me, and said, "This is crap." Wow. And don't you realize we're doing a big science fiction film for an American director and went off to get me fired. <laughs> so I just thought, okay, that's how it's going to be from now on because George is a friend. We've been together and I was making his movie he wanted. Yeah. And it was like that the whole way through. Um, so I bought all this, but the one person who really helped me get this made, Frank Bruton, was a giant prop master who did, Kubrick's movies. He did um, uh, Stanley Kubrick's. Mm. So he and he called me boy. We were so young. <laughs> he said, one day he said, "Okay, boy, what do you want?" And I said, "Clear out your prop room. I don't want anything in here. Just some metal shelves because we're going to get all this airplane junk." He said, "Okay, boy." <laughs> and in comes this low loader. It was a sixteen wheeler, and it had junk airplane crap <laughs> piled on it with airplane engines sticking up and it was backing in. Yeah. Frank was next to me, literally, and I remember he never looked at me, nothing. He just said, you know, you're mad boy, don't you? <laughs> but to give him his due, after about four minutes, he said, okay, boy, the tea's on in my office. I want you in my office and you tell me what you want. So I went and said, look, I've got to teach the prop boys how to strip this down. I need tools, everything. And that's what we did. And I taught the crew how to, because airplanes and submarines don't have one thing and you just stick it randomly. They're, they have like two or three systems in case one fails and everything is actually organized, even though it looks like, like, kind of hair of junk and switches mm -hmm. and so um again this the first set we ever did to show george was the cockpit of the millennium falcon mm -hmm. and um because of the lack of money john barry could only do that view and the view looking out the other way for the hyperspace through the screen we couldn't do side <laughs> angles it wasn't yeah. enough money and um he, John Barry had hired Harry Lang, and Harry Lang was the art director on 2001, who did those beautiful ships, you know? Mm -hmm. And Harry was making it like that. <laughs> he was down there caring so much about all the panels and everything. And I kept going in and saying, Harry, you know, I'm going to mess this up. <laughs> and um, he'd look at me like, young boy what are you doing and then eventually he said okay here it is so i got these fighter pilot seats stuck them and immediately took it down and we mm. i filled in junk and stuff i managed to make the lever that they jump into hyperspace mm. sort of work it never did work properly <laughs> those are airplane <laughs> controls you see the two yes the, the wheels there that's just off airplanes all junk everything that i bought and um so I took George down to show him when we'd finished it. Um, and I think, you know, he smiled. I mean, that was kind of the, the, the kind of, oh, okay, they're doing something that I really want and it's going to work. Yeah. Really all around. It yeah. sounds to me like George felt obviously very comfortable being around you compared to the rest of the crew because yes. there's a lot of documentaries out there that talks about the stress that he under went through, you know, and so that's yeah. really cool to know that because you were there before all these before these other jackasses were even considered yeah. to be on this thing. I have one a quick question um, since we're talking about the Falcon. So I'm pretty familiar on the studio skill side, uh, and I know that a lot of you guys build your props and stuff off of the design of the art, correct? Like McCurry a uh, print, for example. A question that I, I'm curious about. I know it was probably later on that you guys actually built the whole Falcon, but who did, because I know that you've got the people in the States that are actually building the studio scale models. So how did that take place? Did they build the real set X-Wings? Did that stuff get built before 
the studio scale models or was it at the same time out of that <laughs> no it was uh, it was the other way around um we with the exterior so the interiors yeah that obviously we just went ahead and we did that one and i and i did the whole area it took ages to do that one but the <laughs> exterior um john barry had gone to san francisco right from lucky lady and explained that there was never going to be the budget to build a, a exterior right um so he explained how you could do a glass matte painting mm. and he could build half of it, but we had to do it full size because we had the actors going in and out of it and it had to be. To, to, so he um, designed it full size, half kind of built. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you a story about that with Ralph McCorry in a minute. But um, love it. Love it. Um, yeah. That that design the first design that ralph macquarie did when joe johnson was talking with george and george saw it it was exact replica of the eagle in space 1999 it was the same right. Right. so he said no no and there's all this kind of everybody claims it but george it's claimed that george was flying back from london which is what i've heard him say yeah. and there was half a hamburger on the plate and an olive and yeah. he said make it like a hamburger yeah. um and joe johnson claims he did it from a flying saucer and various other things whoever it was that shape turned around but they kept ralph macquarie's cockpit right and just because he was a surfer and really this was his first job yeah. <laughs> Joe johnson he stuck it on the side which is brilliant you'd never do that as a yes. designer yeah but it worked yeah. so then they built the model first okay we were then building the set from it and john barry's draftsman had drawn it up from the model what happened was that on the day they were going to photograph it Joe Johnson saw all the greeblies, all the bits of model shots, model kits they'd stuck on it, and he didn't like one, and he pulled it off, and it got photographed. And afterwards, Joe Johnson said, you've built in a mistake. You've built in the glue. That shouldn't be there. So it's somewhere near the cockpit. He can't remember. I met him at the ranch. We were filming together, and um, he and I, it, we can't remember where it was, but it's on the Millennium Falcon somewhere. There's just a glue patch <laughs> it should have had a greebly yeah. stuck on it that's so awesome that's so they yeah so it was kind of went in tandem like that Man. these are huge stories roger i can't yeah. i'm so i can't i'm just in awe i, I, just, <laughs> well, I can listen to you all night long <laughs> and and roger how do you feel now too because i'm sure when when you're building these things you know you're just grabbing like you said yes. kind of junk just junk. junk yeah and now that the fans are mm -hmm. like overly obsessive like so for example right off the bat i could see there's a volvo panel right that they use for the han solo and carbonite later yes. as panels right here on the on the right. left it's on the panel that Roger game, probably doesn't even know <laughs> right, right well it, it's funny because when i was writing the book and I was researching yeah. certain things. I, I found out, see, yeah, to me, all I did with my buyer was saying, get me junk. There were no computers in that day. So he would get right. me broken down camera parts, mm -hmm. skip loads of stuff. They, they were closing down an old um, telephone exchange near us in London. Mm -hmm. And we went down to look, we bought the lot, everything, mm -hmm. panels, switches, the piping that was in there that carried the, um, carried the telephone lines all of this got built into the set so i anything that came in i would break down i i got so much junk i had to move to the next office it was full <laughs> and to me it was shapes and it, whatever i liked i would take you know yeah. the only drawing i ever did on star wars was trying to figure out luke's binoculars the binobins. bins and I did four or five sketches, and I think they're in the big book of blueprints. Um, even that, I knew, well, I don't have time, and they were all 
um, after me because mm -hmm. we we started in the studio in January the 6th. We were shooting in March. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine yeah. for a film this size? So um, I just had to find pieces. Yeah. You're looking at my dice there. That's what I was going to That's that was gonna be my <laughs> next question. You know, oh, that's a cool you. story, man. That's yeah. awesome. That was came about. So the day I was looking at the set like this with George, and then I said, George, listen, you know, what I like to do is I like to personalize, and I think we should put things in that relate to Han Solo. And you had dice hanging in Ron Howard's car in American Graffiti. And I said, it was good luck. I think we should put a pair of dice in there. He smiled as he does and said, yeah, let's do it. So I, I've got six sets, the big fluffy ones, you know, they always had in American cars mm -hmm. down yeah. to this silver player. He yeah. chose the silver pair. We put them in. They're there for about two shots in Star Wars. And then the grumpy director of photographer who <laughs> was awful to George, I, I have to say it all the way through, yeah. um, got them taken out because they were annoying him. Something went on. Mm. They never got put back. Mm. Um, I was telling the story on a Reddit AMA. Mm -hmm. And um, when we were doing Phantom Menace, mm -hmm. and then a call came in and said, have you seen the cover of Vanity Fair? Mm -hmm. And they're there in the cover of Vanity Fair. JJ had seen them and had an assistant go and find the same type and hung them into the Millennium Falcon. And the scene he put them in, he cut out of the movies. Yeah. <laughs> they only turned back up with um, when Leia gives them to Luke. Well, here we go. Look at it. <laughs> there's yeah. They made you know, and and that's the cool part about about that is that something that you threw in there became yeah Star Wars lore because and especially yeah. like in Solo, right? These yes. are big deal. These are statements. big deal. Um, yeah, the emotional point. Of, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. That, that are, are you are you uh, financially benefiting from these dice? Nothing, <laughs> Roger. Nothing. I get, we've not been nothing. Not what one the hell? single thing. No. It's, sorry, I just had to say that's a bit of bullshit. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know it is. Yeah, David West Reynolds. You know who who wrote the um, first Star Wars books and everything. He called me the other day and he said, "You know, we're the only two who have ever profited on this, so we're going to start doing talks and going around and doing stuff." So <laughs> yeah, I said, wow. "Okay, we will." Yeah. You guys are loved by very. I mean, I mean, you guys are loved by many. Now, Roger, uh, have you now? Obviously, you know you you guys built this this set, which is. Honestly, probably one of my favorite Star Wars sets. Just I love the chess. Um, what can you tell us about that? Number one and number two. Have you had a chance to go to the Galaxy Disney Galaxy's Edge to see the replica of this? No, I still I haven't been down to LA in so long. So yeah. no, it all went up without me knowing, and I was really interested to see. You know, they've done a really good job. They did, to make yeah. it so no i've only seen there was one set that was going around i think one of the big star wars cons that they had a set mm. somebody and i think swedish company built that was really good i, I was telling them wow yours is yours yeah. is really accurate yeah um but it's my favorite set you know and later on if we talk about alien but that's the set that really yeah got ridley interested in how to and do I think it. in the film, the actual film Star Wars, it you nobody you never saw stuff like that in films. You never no. saw huge sets. And it's cool when you're telling me about how you went to get the junk and you know, I know a lot of industry uh, people that worked on the actual, you know, Lauren Peterson. We've talked to these guys and it's crazy how they kit bash in these little you yep. know, 12, 16, 24 inch models and you guys are kit bashing Life size product for life size, yeah. I mean, this it, one, it, it's unbelievable, yeah. It's it, unbelievable. Well, this one, th this is really where I mean, I was a th it was theoretical, it was just my idea out of driving around London in, in my old Mustang that I had an American car, thinking, <laughs> well, I could stick bits in it. This was the set where because Harry Lang hadn't had anything to do with it, this was a set which 
kind of pushed my patients to understand if it would work because we started putting in junk and everything. It looked terrible. And I kept putting more in and more. We were buying more and going on. And I was praying no one would come on the set because I thought, wow, this is not going to work. But when it suddenly came together and we aged it and put in oil drips and we put the pipes and everything, it, it suddenly, and I watched people come on this set like almost gobsmacked. Yeah. You think, how did they get this ship in here? And I knew then we, we'd kind of conquered something that had never been done before. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, these scenes, like this, Gabe, I'm glad you brought this up. It's it's so, like, warm, and you just yeah. want to be there, kind of like when you're on Dagobah, you know? Yeah, it is. And, yeah. and the padding was John Barry's idea to put around the padding, and he took that as a kind of reference from 2001 and thought, let's put that in, but we're junking it up. Yeah. No. It, it became a symbol for Star Wars throughout on the exterior and interiors. Yeah. And it, it's great knowing all of, you know, all those parts, all the, that you, you're buying out. It's, it's amazing to see it kind of all on the set, right? Like, so all yeah. those little, just what people thought were junk. Yeah. Uh, iconic. Yes. From Star Wars. Yeah. It's true. Amazing. Um, this, that was all made out of junk. Yeah. <laughs> now, so, speak, so speaking of that, this is also a very iconic. Oh yeah. Scene, right. I mean, <laughs> Moss Eisley and and the the cantina and all that. Yes. So what what can you tell us about this? And I have a few snapshots that I grabbed and um, but. This, yeah. So the, the, there were snapshots because uh, this is one set that it was. The, almost the last thing we shot mm -hmm. and George was so far behind I thought I'd better take a whole load of reference photographs mm -hmm. um, because I may have to reproduce this back in the studio because they were leaving Tunisia mm -hmm. um, I've still got those I've got my strips of film and, and all of that and in fact I was they're constantly using them so mm -hmm. John Barry designed the little prints in Tunisia so there was the solution how to make this planet that looked real and old and ancient very cheap. Um, it was not that far from London to fly there, and it cost nothing to be there. So John had found by accident this square, mm -hmm. um, and he just built domes to put on the top of the buildings to add those in, and then the moisturizers, which we only had two or three of those because we could only get that on the trucks and we just moved them around every set the same ones mm -hmm. so here most people don't even register it but this crash spaceship is the size of a boeing 747 yeah. you know why it's there why? There's a, because there's an olive tree right behind it and um, that was a farmer's life so we couldn't cut that down so john <laughs> drew this crash spaceship <laughs> They thought I was mad in London because I was piling junk into these trucks to go down to Tunisia because there was nothing in Tunisia, nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I searched uh, so that I, I got ladders and I got what I took down. We had a vac form machine mm -hmm. that John Barry still spoke about even years later that we spent £10,000 on. <laughs> it was an early form of the machine that could print out PVC panels. It actually saved our lives. I mean, they printed out C-3PO's gold pieces on it. Wow. John printed out sheets for the Death Star, and they were simply, he put a wooden frame up, and they were simply stapled on. That's wow. how the whole thing was done. So I grabbed loads of those sheets, stuck them up on the wings and things, and I got up with a blowtorch and, and blow, blow kind of Wow. burnt them yeah and then we got the painters to paint it down and then i did the same with all my junk all over this thing everywhere yeah and we painted it down the sand color and there it is there's this yeah. and that when you think every star wars movie from this one on has always had crash spaceships in them yeah we, and ray was living in one i mean scavenging 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 and things like that so it became a kind of now, a trademark look, if you like. Mm -hmm. so Roger, I, 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 took, I took a couple of screenshots. I'm just going to show a couple of screenshots. You, you, you go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, Roger, I was going to say, I know Jens is, is curious. <laughs> yes. So it's called, I don't know if you guys called it a ball speeder, but what you see is next to Jens. Yeah. Record, yes. So who, came up, who came up with that thing? John Barry designed and built this. It, it, it first intended to be in the desert. Hold it up. Which is the one they like came that. out of, but we all thought it looked like too yeah. much like 2001. Yeah. yeah, there it is. Yeah. So it got left. It wasn't going to be used. So my idea with the cantina, I thought, well, this is my chance to do a space version of a hitching post outside a bar in a Western. Mm -hmm. So I got any, anything that I could find <laughs> sent up from down in the south. I got this put up there, all the speeders I got tied up there. John had designed that Banthoof that the stormtrooper was sitting on in the desert that John was really embarrassed by. Mm -hmm. um, there he is there. Its head would nod. That's all he could do with the money. Right. <laughs> he was embarrassed by it, but I got it up and put it up. So the guy who owned the building, one day my prop, the, the, the truck brought it back up from the desert. I went and tied it up outside. This guy came out shrieked went back into his hut came out with a huge like club and started whacking the animal <laughs> and the more he whacked the more the head nodded he thought it was real and there was dust coming out of it from the desert and stuff yeah. um he That's never hilarious. ever got over it he always thought it was tied up there and it was real it just wouldn't move he came out <laughs> every time with a club and glared at it <laughs> i would take that practical deal the do back i would take that all day long than the cg one all day long yeah i know we, we all yeah, I agree. Um, roger i have a question so the the big upside down dome that's there yeah it's not one of the domes that they you, you guys created for the tops of those or and they just happen to be like left over no or? this was that was actually part of the spaceship design that john okay. did wow that was actually designed as a broken piece of oh, okay. um, like a part of an engine Oh, okay. And then in my photographs, see over the cantina door. Yeah. That's the only example of the Star Wars lettering that George designed. Yeah. And oh, I got a call yeah. from the guys uh, doing Clone Wars and they said, do you know, have you got a sample? And I said, funny enough, I do. And I took one of my photographs, blew it up, and I have a straight on shot of it. So oh. they were able to reproduce the, um, the the real Star Wars lettering from, oh, from wow. New Hope. It's amazing. That when you guys finished shooting these, where, where did a lot of it, did this stuff stay behind a lot of this, or did it get hauled off? Well, a lot of it stayed behind because, you know, it's, yeah. and the, the skeleton is the, there. So you see, these are all like um, different kind of models of, speeders yeah i love it but yeah. i just got them all and tied up there they won't work in the one yeah they, they were <laughs> thrown in just to make it look a bit more like a, a, a space station yeah hitching post i love the spider looking one that one's really cool yeah he was cool that one yeah. That's um yeah so this and, and this yeah and these are these are probably your pictures, right? <laughs> yeah, I think they are here now. Yeah, yeah very rare. Yeah, because no one ever had them. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. yeah. It's all like it's all Death Star panels broken. <laughs> wow, <laughs> yeah. that's amazing! That's just amazing. Yeah, I'm speechless. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You and me. So too. most of the stuff got left, and the same with that's with the famous skeleton in in the desert. That uh, I heard about that. That was my right? Yeah, Robert Watts at the end said, um, we're leaving it there because we can't afford to take it back, so just leave it. And it got left. And D wow. David West Reynolds found it. He was the first one who took him days climbing through deserts and stuff. Yeah. I got to meet him in person when Lauren Peterson and a couple other, uh, Jason Eaton, um, it, it was Wonderfest in Kentucky. Oh, yes. It was about a month ago. I got to meet with him. Yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. He's the ultimate yeah, geek. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not that much of a geek. But now, if he's watching, I just respectfully. Yeah. He had some really, really awesome footage that we got. Oh, yeah. I used all of that in the documentary, all of his first 
gonna because he was an archaeologist he was actually in egypt on a dig yes and he thought you know these sets for star wars and, and location sites should be registered so people could visit them they should be like you know mm -hmm. ancient monuments and uh, when he called lucasfilm nobody had any clue See, no one thought this film was going to work everything in england was dumped in the trash there were no records anywhere of where we shot mm -hmm. and this was driving rick mccullum crazy because he had to go back on phantom menace mm -hmm. um and he just by chance remembered and his words to me where he said yeah with this get that kid on the phone who called in here maybe he's got some idea and he flew david west reynolds to tunis Mm -hmm. And David was the same. He was like a kid going around with his DPs and the art directors, and they're mm -hmm. looking at him thinking, who is this kid, you know, telling us what to do. They were eating out of his hand by the <laughs> end of the day because he'd level. taken clips of the film. He knew not only where the locations, he knew each angle that we shot, everything. Wow. So he, they invited him to the ranch, and he became head of literature, and then he wrote those first Star Wars books. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, he was kind of standing out when he was in in the room. He was definitely uh, the center of the attention. Yes. He had his boots to his knees. I mean, yeah. he looked like a jockey. Right? <laughs> yeah, no, he, he's got a <laughs> Jedi costume that he wears all the time. Yeah, yeah that, that wasn't a Jedi costume, though, but it oh. was kind, kind of. It was like a oh, modern day. It was a modern day, you know, United oh. States Jedi costume, I guess. Oh, I see. Yeah. He was not trying to dress up like Obi-Wan or <laughs> he's he's got a beautiful um, DeLorean restored that he drives yes. around in. Oh, yes. so I just hey. built one myself. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, Roger. So what, I, what about the land speeder? I mean, what can you well, tell us about this when you're... That, um, this, this we also made in our time in Lee Studios because, again, John Barry thought, this is never going to work. How are we going to do this? And we better make one and get the scale right. And he was reading the script saying in the, when they got caught in the um, checkpoint, mm -hmm. there was mm -hmm. Luke, Obi-Wan Kenobi, C-3PO, R2-D2. So he built a nice four-seater one. We did a big one. And to make it, again, Bill Harmon, my carpenter, had more wood at home. He scrounged some from another production he actually built the first one on wheelbarrow wheels. He took them off his wheelbarrows at home. And we built one on that. And then George came down and said, no, no, Luke would have a little tiny sports car that's all dented, you know, and he's kept going. So it came down to that size. Mm -hmm. um, wow. They Special effects had started in their own studio and they had a Volkswagen chassis. So they brought that over and then the front got cut off and Bill welded a motorbike front with a single wheel for the front. Mm. Um, George watched him weld and, and said to him, I, that you're probably, that's the worst bit of welding I've ever seen. In my life. <laughs> but he says, Bill said, well, I'm doing it all myself. I never, I never said I was a welder. Yeah. Um, that thing, um, they, for a ride to see how it would work down the studios with um, George watching Gary Kurtz and his wife Meredith was there. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the thing went wrong. It hit the wall, the wing fell off, it went down, and these immortal words from Gary's wife saying, wow, this sure ain't Hollywood, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but it worked because we, we, you know, George could see the scale and everything, and we got it working. And then when we were in the studios finally we did try hovercraft to see if it worked but they're so unstable you can't film with them mm -hmm. um, there were tiny little sports cars called an ogle that mm -hmm. beautifully designed they were near the studio and um, so they went to see them and they agreed to make the land speeder and they cut mm -hmm. down a, a reliant robin which mm -hmm. is famous for mr beam oh yeah <laughs> yeah so they cut the top off, and in fact, if you look at a Reliant Robin, the, the steering wheel and the dashboard, that's actually in the land speed. It's the same. We didn't change it. Oh, that Roger, can you can you still find those over in your neck of the woods? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Lee, I would love to have one of those. Yeah, no, they're still around, and they're in the you know they're in the Mr. Bean movie. So somebody's got all those somewhere in a, in yeah, a yard. For sure. For yeah, sure. yeah, they're quite famous. Well, going back to your your, your right. airplane finds and your you know yeah. the, those are all airplane coolers. Yeah, uh, from jet engines. They they just they they John Barry just I, I also bought. PVC rain piping, which you could get from about a quarter of an inch up till two foot sewer pipe. So I built a, I bought a whole load of it, had a stack. These are all the PVC piping that he used. Mm -hmm. um, and by then the draftsman had stopped thinking I was mad. And John was building all of my junk as the set. So they were actually draw, drawing the sets up using my junk. They were now coming down and taking stuff from mine. And that's how these all came about. Wow. And there's Tupperware in there. Yeah. yeah. You also got some hookahs there? Yeah, we got hookahs. Um, <laughs> it was a way to justify the kind of smoky atmosphere in there. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. No, and and those those jet engine parts obviously are became infamous or yeah. infamous because they reused them right for IG eighty eight. Yes, eleven. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's his head. Same one from the canteen. So once again, I ask: Are you benefiting in any way? Nothing. From <laughs> <laughs> they, no. Roger. No. Yeah. Go on. Now, were you you were in there, and that's how you're just breaking apart that engine, and you. Yes. Got this part and said this would yeah. be yeah how yeah. did that the, we would just break down the all the pieces and on the shelves then they would put like four of those and three of these and four of those so this was then the draftsman coming down and saying okay we need those drink dispensers so they took all the ones that i had and if we needed more we bought more engines because they were cheap wow. um and they gold plated them Oh. So that they had a different look. That's what they changed them with and stuck pipes in, and they made them look like drink dispensers. Nice. It became a kind of... Uh, I was the kind of heart of a holy grail where they were just... Jeez. Even the costume designer was always in my room taking pieces to add on to set on these costumes. <laughs> You're and growling at them. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I welcomed in. You know, we, we were awesome. all in it together, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. That's well, great. Roger, not only that, but I think one of the the grail parts from from that and i'll kind of skip ahead a little bit um was the obi-wan parts because a lot of parts came from that same the yeah. same engine well not a lot of, but some of the parts and yeah. right now these things i mean one little piece five thousand dollars six thousand well that you can see that's a rifle grenade yeah I actually got one. <laughs> you have? Yeah. And yeah. the other bit down there is a um, is a uh, Rolls Royce part of an engine. Yeah. Um, oh, you have got one. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Look at it. It's one is of that the... a real one or you made it? Yeah, no, it's a real one. I, oh, I, right. I, oh, I got you found one. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's obviously <laughs> commission, but Gen yeah. genuine nerd, Roger. Genuine nerd. Buddy. Yeah. Genuine nerd. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so I mean, that, yeah, that it's, it worked. You know, it gave a kind of look to it, and those bits on the end—they they were anything from the junk pile that looked right. Well, and it's so interesting because, yeah, like the Obi Wan saber, right? You got a, a sink faucet, you know, yes. knob, calculator <laughs> parts, you yeah, got parts from the engine. I mean, that just—it's so yeah, you know. Impressive. Roger, it's sickening at what, what you have done to a lot of people out there. <laughs> yeah, it's a sickness. I, I mean, these people, we've got a, a good friend of ours, Ryan, who looks very much up to you like a lot of us. Yeah. And he is, I mean, so into the found parts. And he does such a fantastic job, you know, putting these things together. Mm -hmm. But this is all stuff that is done, you know, because of what you on the fly we're doing you know yeah, that's on the fly no money i, I always yeah. say that we did these things they didn't cost anything yeah i was yeah. just using bits and pieces that yeah. we got from junk piles well speaking yeah. of bits and pieces roger you you can't do an interview without <laughs> talking about this yes. right here the, the graphics yes right? you you, you got to tell us got to junk, junk gabe junk <laughs> no, this one was, um, it drove me mad because 
you know, I, I kind of grew up with King Arthur and Excalibur and, and these, and I knew when you think about King Arthur, it's Excalibur you think about, and I knew if this film was going to work, this lightsaber would be the icon of Star Wars, and, and also it's the weapon of the Jedis, and I knew it had to be special. I could not find anything. I kept looking and looking. Um, one day, Destiny, I, I made Luke's binoculars out of three different camera parts, and I stuck them with super glue, and I thought, you know, so that it's identifiable to the audience watching without explaining it, I'll stick two camera lenses on the front. So I went to Brunning's camera hire shop where we got everything. They, they were, the manager there would rent us stuff. And um, I, I bought the two lenses and then I, I, I asked him if, I said, have you got anything that I, I'm trying to make this weapon? And I couldn't really explain it to him because he had no clue. But he said, well, there's some boxes under there that probably haven't been used for years and years underneath the shelf. There were loads of them. It was the first one I pulled out. Mm -hmm. I opened the lid and there was tissue paper. And then now the music starts to rise and it, we go in slow motion because there was this Graflex handle. Yeah. There were three of them. Um, and I just lifted it out. And I just thought, I just found the Holy Grail. And I could have used it because it, it's designed for something else, but you don't know what. And it's beautifully designed. It has a red firing button. It had a glass button. It, it looked right. I just grabbed all of them, raced to studios, and I had some T-strip left over from the blaster. Yeah. So I thought, well, it needs a handle. So I stuck that round the end to make the handle. Um, and then you had a picture there for the, I didn't like the clasp. I thought that looks like a clasp. And I, that day had been breaking down a Texas instrument calculator mm -hmm. and that bubble strip is illuminates the numbers and magnifies them and it fitted beautifully. So I put that in and called George over and said, look, I think I found it. Um, and he held it and it's quite weighty. Yeah. Um, held it and smiled and that was it um and then he just wanted a d-ring on the end because the only time it's used in um in the desert in on tatooine was hanging on his belt yeah. so i had i'd hired a, an old friend of mine who used to make junk sculptures out of old like me the scrap metal and stuff he was doing he was a sculptor um, and I got him hired in a special position in the film industry, which had never been done before. And he was my prop making assistant, making special props. So he had a box of stuff because there was no money for him to have any tools or stuff. He had boxes of junk and he had the D rings at the end. So he stuck those in yeah. um, and there it was. And it went out straight to Tunisia. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And there, I, I mean, you don't know about the effect of the how the lightsaber is actually going to look. I do. Well, did you guys about. have an idea? Did George no, get that to no, you? Like, no one knew. And I, just what happened was, yeah. So here I am. Good, good this, job, Gabe. Yeah. Good this, job. Gabe. This when I went, um, I was invited by Disney when they were digitizing the six movies. I was invited to go to um, the archives. This is where I met Joe Johnson afterwards. So John Rinsler and I with Laura, who's in charge of the archive, we were looking, describing the blasters, all the different things they had. And then they said, Laura's got a, a surprise for you. Um, and this is when we were doing Phantom Menace. She said, we've got several boxes that we've never opened still from the original film. We opened one and we found this. And um, in there, there's Laura. So what it, it on the set, I didn't have a day off. I, I was in there at seven in the morning until 10 o'clock at night every day for a year almost. Mm. We used to meet John Barry, myself and the two art directors and my prop buyer and the prop master in my office because I had a kettle and some milk and tea bags. And more important was McVitie's chocolate biscuits. 
<laughs> because the <laughs> film industry ran on them. They would eat copious amounts of them in, in chocolate biscuits. I've yeah. never heard of a chocolate biscuit. <laughs> they were um, the McFitties are very famous. They're chocolate on one side and a digestive underneath. Uh, even mm. I was working down on another film, and everyone said, "What do you want? We're coming out." And I said, "Get the McVitties down." <laughs> so, <laughs> The British film industry ran on them. Anyway, one morning there, we were talking, and I said, you know, for that lightsaber effect, I used to do art installations, and we were messing about with front projection paint, and I said, you could get a glow off it. So we went down, had a meeting with the special effects boys. The DP immediately said, that won't work. You're not doing it, and it's going to spoil my lighting on the set. George just overrode him and said, try it. And so John Steers drilled out the end of the handle. I, I, I made him a handle. I had to make about three or four of these lightsabers. So one I gave them as a template. They drilled the end out. Where John Steers was clever, he put a little tiny motor in with the wooden dowel, and he put it slightly off center so that it, it didn't just rotate. It wobbled a tiny bit. You could hardly see it. And when we tried it, you can see this one is glowing. That's just from the lights in the um, in the archive, mm -hmm. and it worked. Mm -hmm. um, not enough to be in the film. George obviously rotoscope, but it gave them something to rotoscope on. And the other thing was that we all made a decision early on that the lightsabers should not cut through each other. Mm -hmm. They should act like swords and, and buzz when they hit, but they wouldn't go through each other. So this gave Alec Guinness and Dave Prowse something to hit against yeah, right. with their fight when they were doing it. Yeah. There's actually a picture, I found it in the archives, um, which is, I think everyone's seen now, of Luke holding it when he's presented the lightsaber by um, Obi-Wan Kenobi. And there's a picture of Luke holding this with the wooden dowel in it. Okay. Jason Eaton actually remade one of those and added at Wonderfest. Really? Just by putting like a flashlight on it, how it would work. Yeah. It would, it would oh, really? It. Oh, I'd love to have seen that. that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's a whole community that's that's worked on on replicating that. that really? Stuff. Yeah. There's a whole community. I'll, I'll send you over some. Yeah, yeah I do. Images and all that. Um, but yeah, they, they've replicated Luke's, I mean, the, the Vader one, the Obi-Wan, yes. the Luke one. I mean, they've replicated all of them, and they actually spin and, and everything. It's pretty cool. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Roger, I also wanted to talk to you about two two of my favorite sets, too. And, and I, I, I wanted to kind of just pick your brain and see if, were these also done over in um, the UK, which would be... Yes. That one, did you, you yes. work on that set as well? Yeah, yeah. This was, was, this was actually uh, an interesting set. Um, John Barry had designed it. Gil Taylor would have nothing to do with John or my. He refused to look at drawings mm -hmm. because you have to, as a designer, work with the DP of how to light it. Mm -hmm. the day, so I looked at the set and I thought it needs a communication device. So I, I, part of the junk that was broken, there was a heater oh. and that was it. So I took that and said, wow, this is good. And I cut the, the wire off and I got the painters to spray it. Yeah. And we stuck that in the middle of the table and it just worked. I, I hardly put anything else in there. I thought that's it. Yeah. The chairs, I searched, I couldn't find anything. So John Barry actually designed these. Oh. They were made in the studio. Great job. When, wow. when George went to shoot this set on the first day, um, mm -hmm. he was in the office. I was somewhere else doing other, doing the trash compactor, I think. And then the call came that Gil Taylor walked off the set and said, I can't light this, um, and gone up to the office with Gary. Mm -hmm. And the call came up to John Barry, and John Barry went straight down there and looked at it and he said what I had designed it was we cut these panels out and so they got on and did it and he was lighting the set the word went back up to Gil Taylor who was complaining in the office that John Barry's lighting your set <laughs> um, yeah. yeah this was typical of our days <laughs> so he, he came yeah. down very grumpy but that's how it was done you see they put tracing paper 
on the grills and then they lit it down from there which is internal lighting which is what it should be and mm. the color of this it was supposed to be it, john designed it as a beautiful black the whole death star and again gil taylor would not have it yeah and he had to lighten it lighten it until in the end we said no more uh, yeah. and it went into a kind of more gray color but originally it would look stunning when it was black yeah, yeah it's badass on film roger why do you think um the dp was so disrespectful to to george is i know obviously he was a young director and this was something that's never been really seen before but it's well, i mean a dp and a in a director they're supposed to be like the best of buds and they, they have to be they're the eyes yeah. i don't know i was so disappointed i mean this man made the beatles movie he made dr strange love he lit i mean he's just classics i, I yeah. don't know what happened to him yeah. he was grumpy bad tempered and his interview, and it's interesting because I wanted to put his interview in the book, but they wouldn't let me. Mm -hmm. um, because in his interview, he talks about going to meet John Barry, um, uh, sorry, George and Gary in the Chinese restaurant next to the studio. And that's where they met Alec Guinness. They, they did a turn sixpence lunch special. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> that, that fitted our budget. But um, he then, he complained, he said, well, you know, I just wanted wine, and they looked at me badly, like, you know, because George doesn't drink, and nor does Gary, religiously, or, and George doesn't. Um, and he also, he said, I have no idea why they hired me, I had no experience of science fiction, I don't know what it was. That's exactly why George hired him. George yeah. has said, mm -hmm. When I first met him and, and all the way through, he was making a documentary. He wasn't making a science fiction film. Mm. He didn't want it to look like a science fiction film. He wanted it to look real and to be shot like that. So Gil had no idea that that's what it was. And I think from then on, and you have to remember in Britain at the time, a and one American culture was in the toilet in Britain. It was just derided everybody. Science fiction, I, honestly, if I ever owned up at a dinner party with typical Brits at the time that I was reading Dune or reading, you know, any of the classics, um, I just got the same comment. Oh, it's not Shakespeare, is it? Mm -hmm. um, it is, actually, <laughs> and it's prophetic. I mean, William Gibson like, invented the Internet. I mean, just... You yeah. know, Frank Herbert, June. I mean, these things are masterworks and uh, prophecy. So that counted. George was a young American director who didn't come in with a bullhorn and like the typical, you know, yelling and shouting yes. how yes. they all were. He was a very quiet, very shy, dedicated to making this film. It was a children's film that none of them understood and i think all of that just for some reason he took this and the only thing with the brits if they took a job they worked and they did it they grumble and moan all the way through it but i i don't know and gill he was later in his very late in life before he died he was asked this question and and he said yes my only regret is not getting to know the director better mm -hmm. Gil tried to get him fired off his own movie, you know. Yeah, yeah. He was awful, awful, yeah, yeah. awful man. And he was the one, if George had one shot left on a whole scene to do, British unions, and Gil was the trade union representative on the floor, and you'd have to ask for permission to shoot five or 15 more minutes. He, yeah, he that's what I was going to ask. He always said no, which screwed us up because then you've got a set left over which should have been pulled down that night and right. built another one because we were so compressed yeah. um yeah it was i don't know it was just belligerence and, and there a lot of them were like that the first ad was supercilious to george mm. and george isn't political he wouldn't fight back he just got his head down and got on with it yeah, i heard yeah. such rude things said to george in his face were you were you people. there roger when the yeah. that took place yeah were you reserved? Yeah. Obviously, you, you didn't I, No, we just got on with our work, you know. We, was, we were doing the right thing. It's interesting. Um, there's a YouTube... Um, there's a YouTube interview between Christopher Nolan and George Lucas that you can see now, and they're talking about movie-making. And George was... 
being pretty open on it because he isn't, you know, there's nothing you ever right. hear about him. Right. And at one point he said, you know, Christopher, there were only five people stood by my side during the making of Star Wars and that was the art department. Yeah. He actually said it in words then. And he told me that when, when he met, well, he told it to, um, when I first went to meet Rick McCullum in the office, when Rick walked in, George said, you know, Roger was one of the few people, five of them only, who stood by me on that film and got me through it. Yeah. Good, man. That's awesome. Roger. And, and Roger, I mean, honestly, from the, the, the look, what you guys did, especially with the look of Star Wars, right? The lived in, worn look, you revolutionized. I mean, the film industry, the, the yes, it film did. industry, it was, right? Wasn't it the first time you yes. really saw a grimy, yeah, grimy, yes. real, and the audience didn't have to question it. It's part of why it worked. You know, they never had to question, oh, Tatooine, this, this is a real place. This is where they lived. You know, it's not, I don't know why costumes, if you look at early science fiction films, they always had Indian Nero collars and smart suits and, and terrible sets that were over-designed and, and you, you didn't believe a thing you were watching. It just wasn't comfortable on the eyes. And that was my mission yeah. to change that and to make it like, you know, and often you're the unsung heroes at the time because no one sees it, no one notices it. You're just, it's a lived in world they're in. Yeah. Um, and Roger, I wanted to, I wanted to point out something that, um, so obviously, you know, you, you watch Star Wars, the, especially, uh, the first film and, you know, like you're talking about, it's very lived in, very grimy. I love the fact, and I'm going to show this next picture of this contrast, because just like you're saying, it's real, it's, it's realistic of this, this set right here, right? So, right. That I love that because everything else, right, is 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 worn in dirty, and then you go into you know Aunt Beru's kitchen. Yeah, it's, it's clean as it should be, right? Yeah, because like, like, the outside is so grotty and grungy yeah. and stuff. So John Barry, this was John Barry. This is actually the shape of an aeroplane. If you look at it, exactly the whole interior of an aeroplane. Oh, is that holy <laughs> crap? Because it sure the hell is. Yeah, because yeah. we worked out that on Tatooine, anything like this would have to be brought in. So mm. it would have to be economically brought in and also standardized. So he then thought, well, let's take it from an airplane interior and, and I'll do it exactly like that. Yeah. I never knew that. that I mean, yeah. that's just... A lot of people never knew that. That's no, And it's, it was the Jeez. purposeful thing, you know, when... when because he didn't do much. He added domes and stuff on, on the buildings and we built the exterior of the cantina, but we grunged it down and made it look, putting in electric panels all over the place, putting in different functioning things that under the surface was actually a functioning planet and a water collection systems and all of this. There was technology here. Yeah. This is the future on a different world. So this was part of how to kind of show that. And, and I love it. I mean, again, that contrast, right? And especially yeah. in that scene that it goes from very deserty, dirty, and then right. she's over to her. And it's just you as a, as a you know, a fan, well, a fan, obviously, but as, as a, a film watcher, like you're, you're engulfed in it. You're yes. in, the, in the space. You're in the world. And you guys did an amazing job with that. And there's lots of scrap in there. I mean, all those containers at the back, we just dressed yeah. it in. And Tupperware, a Tupperware to come out at the time. Yeah. And I got a lot of that. Yeah. Those are containers, I think, from actual airplanes that we stuck in there. Yeah. Beautiful. Who had the idea with these iconic door frames? I love, I love these door frames. Yeah. That's John Barry. He yeah, has, yeah, it's it's um, a tribute to him. We put it everywhere, and it also standardized it outside and inside. It wasn't like, oh, here's a different set for this, and here's a different one for that. Everything kind yeah. of was comfortable to the eye that it was part of this universe. Yeah, he, he was a genius, John Barry. No, I, I that's great. Um, now I just want to show you a couple of other little little pictures here. I got um, that. Some that you you sent over that I want to I want to bring up so just so you could kind of tell us you know we saw these um, obviously here's 
you and George, right? That's on Phantom Menace. That's Phantom Menace. Okay. Yeah. And and can you tell us just a little bit about Phantom Menace, about your just your experience and Yeah, that you know, when um after Star Wars, when he was making Empire, I'd done Alien, I'd done Life of Brian, and I thought it's enough. I've got to start trying to make my own film. So I'd written Black Angel. Mm-hmm. And by sheer accident, I couldn't get it made with a film school budget because I was in film school for a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was actually at the sound mix on Alien. I was sitting learning because uh, Bill Rowe, the sound mixer, was the best in the world at the time. And um, the head of Fox asked me what I was doing in London. And I said, oh, I've written this short film. And I, it, it's a kind of epic kind of... And I can't afford to do it. <laughs> so yeah. He said, well, show it to me. And I sent it by... Um, we didn't have faxes then. I, I, there was some machine I could send it to him overnight. And um, he said, you know, George was really upset with us with a short film that we put out with Star Wars. He thought it alienated the audience. And there was a government grant of £25,000 for a short film that would accompany a, f- a feature. He said, do you mind if I send it to George? Because we have to make a decision by Friday of a short film we are going to make. Because he said get the filmmaker to apply for the grant, and then I'll guarantee it goes out with Empire. Um, And he said, we're not really sure about the ones we've got, and I'd really like to send this to George, and he did. And and the next day it came back and said, well, George has commissioned it. And it was a kind of thank you to me for standing by him. So I got to make that. And Where can we see that, Roger? It's on YouTube right now. Yeah, it's, we've got nearly a million hits on it, apparently. Um, that's awesome, Roger. That's awesome. on that. I was very worried about it being seen, so I did a, a, a prelude to it because it's like 45 years old and it was slow, different tempo to anything seen now. But it, I got It's very really Excalibur to me. When I yeah. the, the little part of the documentary I've seen, it it reminded me of Excalibur, just the, 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 set, the music, everything about it. Well, interesting enough, John Borman, I I had met, John Borman invited me and the DP down to Pinewood Studios, and he showed, and I didn't know this, but the whole crew were there, and he showed them my short film and said, that's what I want. Yeah. And the, the oh, DP, that's so awesome. The DP, I was wondering what the time frame, <laughs> yeah. okay, wait a minute, the so, time frame difference is, was you, Roger, then... That that's crazy. Yeah, and um, the DP was throwing up in the back because he was so nervous, and I was apologizing, saying, "John, I had twenty five thousand. I I had all the short ends. I had to make this work." And um, and I said, "You're going to have a crew of two hundred and toilets and canteens. I had one car, <laughs> and we drove around, and I measured out how much I could film for each shot." Yeah, I know about together. that, but. Um, yeah, and also the Yoda fight on Empire, George really liked. I didn't have enough footage to make up my 25 minutes. My editor said, listen, there's a thing called step printing. I think it'll help the fights because I had no choreographer. We, we just had pieces of the fight. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you duplicated the negative. So he did a test with the lab and we duplicated it once, twice, the three times, four, five, and six times. And we chose about the third doing it three times to slow it down. And it looked amazing. It's not like slow motion. It's different. Mm. George then slowed the fight down in the cave with Obi-Wan. Um, and he step printed that. So, yeah, so, yeah, John Borma, bless him. I, it's just, and then he said to me, listen, I really like your underwater sequence. Would you mind? I, I want to do the same thing in Excalibur. And I said, John, I'm more, just being flattered. I, this is a short, tiny film. You're going to make a film that I would have done anything to make, which is Excalibur. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, um, it has a lot of kind of similarities to it and the look yeah. and everything that he did. Wow. He was great, John. John Bourne was another amazing British filmmaker, unsung. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Movie. That's awesome. So then 
I was waiting for my feature film, The Sender, to trigger, and I got a call one day in London saying, what are you doing? And I said, I'm waiting for the finance. And so George said, would you come? He was doing the second unit on Return of the Jedi mm. himself. And then when you look at those three films, George's least favorite of all his movies is Empire Strikes Back because he had the least to do with it. Mm -hmm. Most adults like it because it's an adult movie. Yeah. When you look at A New Hope, it's made for nine to 12 year olds and he wanted Return of the Jedi, it was then Revenge of the Jedi, to be exactly the same target audience. So he decided he had to spend more time with um, Richard on, on the first team and they asked if I would come and take over, so I did. I, I, I got the honor of shooting Harrison. They couldn't schedule him in, coming out of the carbon. Uh, block. So, which, which one is your favorite movie? Uh, I'm not just because of the involvement, but A New Hope mm. is a perfect myth. Yeah. He was mentored by Joseph Campbell, and it's it's taught the world the right kind of you know religions that maybe aren't communicating so well with youth. Star Wars did globally because it's got the right message to the world children adults everybody and it's you know good triumphs over evil and and how it comes through and all of that i think is in that movie i think it's just really my favorite i have to say not just because of the involvement in it but i just think the whole thing and what it's done and, and what it became mm. but uh, i liked all three of those mm. then when i was Doing the sound mix, I always use the Saul's Ant Studio in Oakland. Mm. I was up doing that, and I got a call by Rick McCullum saying, could you come to the ranch? We have to sort a credit out. Somebody wanted an art department credit who didn't deserve it, and he said, come and talk to me about it, and George wants to say hello. I went up there. We had a chat and everything, um, and they said, come and see us when you go back to Leveson. We want to see you there. So I did, I went there and I was immediately dragged in. They said, oh, the, de the um, designer wants to meet you. And I went in and he said, what do I do? I don't understand how to communicate to George. He doesn't say anything and he was panicking. And I said, listen, <laughs> present him with everything. If he likes it, you'll get a smile. If he doesn't <laughs> like it, he'll tell you what he wants. Yeah. Do it like that. The, the same with the, the set deck who was just panicking and said he can't, can't get. And I said, do it. Do everything. Just get on with the job and show him. That's what we did. That's what he expects from everybody on the crew. And then the, the funny enough, the DP on that, I'd started him off doing commercials in Italy, his first jobs ever. And so he said, why aren't you doing second unit? This, this, if we've got 12 weeks to shoot this 22-week movie. Why aren't you doing it? So I... I I kind of went in to see George and Gary, and then I said, who's doing second year? Oh, we don't need it. We're going to be fine, and Ben Burt's going to come and do a few days. <laughs> and I thought, you're delusional. <laughs> because That's crazy. George doesn't like shooting very much. Um, and um, so I said, listen, you know I'm part of this world and everything. Just put my name down. Yeah. <laughs> and I was then, um, I got a call, what are you doing? And I said, I was actually working out in a gym. And they said, can you drive up here now? So I drove up and I sat with George and, and Gary and uh, George and, and Rick McCullum. And they said, well, what are you doing? Because we, we do need second unit and we'd like you to do it. Could you do it? Are you able to do it? And I said, well, yeah. I've, uh, and when could you start? And I said, well, I've just got to go to Vancouver and do a color timing and do this stuff. And they said, no, no. You've got to start now. <laughs> We're going to leave the room, and you've got five minutes to decide. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so I made a call quickly, and the DP said he could go and do the, the color timing. And um, I said, okay, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> and George Fantastic. said, well, one other thing. What are you doing in October? And I said, well, if I'm doing this, I'm on. He said, good, because I have to leave at a certain point, and it's, there's still the schedule, so you'll have to stay and finish up the film. Wow. 
That's a lot of trust, and that, that says a lot about It does. But you. then gotcha. the five minutes were up. They said, come with us. There was an office set up with an assistant in the office for me. <laughs> already, <laughs> they already knew the answer. <laughs> but I then understood um, they got the two crews who did Young Indy, mm. and they trained those two crews to be like amazing clockwork. They would leapfrog each episode. Mm. And they got all the bad apples out. They got it working beautifully, you know. So they said, your first set you're going on, you're going on first. We can't schedule the first unit in. And that was the um, the Senate with all the pods floating around. Oh, yeah. So I had to go on first on that set. So we were setting the lighting. We were setting everything for it. We did have ILM then, and we did not like the first one. We only had six paintings by Ralph Macquarie. Now we had visualizations and everything at work. But I think six times we were first unit on Phantom Menace. And, and literally, George kind of divided a lot of it in two. And I got amazing stuff. I shot a lot of the Darth Maul fights with wow. Ewan McGregor and um, Liam. I shot with Natalie. I shot everybody on it. Wow, and I That's loved the best it. You know, part of the whole movie. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I loved it. I shot a lot of the Padre stuff. Yeah, did you um, like that movie, Roger? Did you? Yeah, I did. I thought he did a really good job. That yeah. and the Last Skywalker. Yeah. I think, yeah, he he's a great filmmaker, and I think he he had to do a duty, which was to bring the fans back, and mm -hmm. to bring them back, he had to do the first movie over again and bring it back to what the fans kind of were were missing for what 20 years since return yeah. of the jedi yeah yeah we we recently well a few months ago we had don beast on, yes. on the show and, and he was talking about his experience you know with obviously with the prequels and obviously the archives too because i know he was very yes. involved in the archives but um all the all the amazing kind of just experiences from the prequels um that now I think the fans, maybe at first when the prequels came out, you know, there was a little pushback from the older fans. But right. now I think the Star Wars fans embraced it. They love the prequels. It's, yeah. it's a, like a new found love for the prequels, which is it's great to see. You know? I always say now, you know, just the pod race is worth the price of admission to a cinema. Yeah. yeah. You know, just alone in itself. I mean, what, yeah. it, it, it's it's there's the first ever yeah. creatures created and that's Watto. Oh yeah. Look at him. No one ever mentions him, but he is a perfect living creature that you never even question that he's not real. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. Gra yeah. Gra Roger, yeah. I'm sorry, Gabe. What do you think Roger about um, what's happened to film and, and streaming and this what are your thoughts about the the film industry today? It's it's very difficult now, you know, for all of us and to get funding and everything because it's it's down to streamers and as you know, I mean, I understand this strike going on because <coughs> nobody can make any money anymore. I, I, very, I agree with you. It's very difficult to get finance because there's there's no Blu-ray left. There's nothing to back it up with, so it's a streamer and they just yes. that's it. They give you money and that's it and it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but they're still getting out. You know, there are, you know, the, 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 obviously American makes superhero movies better than anyone. And you get this blast of experience and everything in the cinemas. The only difference to me is it doesn't last. It's like Star Wars has lasted. Yeah. Alien has lasted. Oh, yeah. yes. Those movies, the original Supermans, the original Terminator, mm -hmm. they somehow keep in the DNA. These huge new ones come and go. Yeah. And they're great. There's nothing wrong with them. You know, I go, I take my son every Saturday night. We go and see whatever the big ones are, and they're exhilarating. But um, there's something about, and you know, look at the difference. When we made Phantom Menace, I was chatting with Rick McCullum about it, and they, they said, we're really nervous. Uh, George hasn't directed for 20 years. The, the Star Wars has been missing. All we need to do is get the money back because it's George's own money. He didn't go to a studio, nobody. Right, right. And 
it was $110 million, the budget. Mm. Rick said, you know, I, I put the script to every Hollywood studio to get it budgeted, and they all came back over $400 million. Mm. And I think that's the difference. Again, George made them like independent movies. Mm. There was everything was tight and controlled and um, no kind of um, the, the tension wasn't there. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, I did like Rogue One. I, I think Gareth did a supreme job and it's the closest to me of a Star Wars movie. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. We 100%. Love it. Yeah. yeah. You know, the thing is, Roger, you and, and all these other great um, set decorators and, and artists that worked around you, I mean, you guys made it so easy for these actors because when they came on these beautiful sets that you guys created, it just made their job that much easier. They didn't have all yeah. these blue screens around them, and it's just it's fantastic to be able to walk in and what a it's, piece of junk. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it is back. interesting, too, because I, I met Christopher Nolan here when he brought Dunkirk to the IMAX, and I met him afterwards. And then, because he's a huge Star Wars nerd, he always says that's... He, and I, I asked him, I said, do you remember when you first saw it? And he said, oh, I was 11 in the cinema in America, <laughs> and it was an 11 o'clock performance, and it changed my life and everything. And then he said, he looked at me and he said, you did it all, didn't you? And I said, yeah, I had to do everything, the robots, the, the whole lot. And he said, nowadays it's all compartmentalized. Somebody yeah. does this weapon, somebody does that. Yeah. You had to do everything yourself. And I said, yeah, I did. That's why we didn't sleep that year. Yeah. yeah. That's what's so fantastic is the, that we're able to document, like so many other things that you've put together, um, which we will bring up, by the way. But the fact that this is going to be documented. These stories that have never been told that right. that are just fantastic. I just it's such an honor to be able to be in your presence and hear these fantastic stories. I know Gabe is in. I mean, he's a replica guy, you know. Yes. So we yeah. found out the possibilities of having somebody like you on and yeah, because you know, I, it, 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 and it's understandable why. But the making of official ones. Mm -hmm. John Barry and my name aren't even mentioned. There's not a thing about any of this. And um, that's why David West Reynolds forced me to write Cinema Alchemist to put it all down. He said, you owe it. It's a legacy. And it's going to be yeah. studied way into the future. There'll be universities studying Star Wars and everything. So I did. And then yeah. we managed to get a bit of funding here with a, a producer, Ritu Sharda, and, and an American, Stephen Neer, they put up a bit of money, and I, I made it during COVID with my editor alone in a studio. Yeah. I had to find a way to do it, but um, I got Guillermo del Toro, who's a yeah. huge fan, yes. who I knew, and like with him, it was a question, he said, I can do it on this day, I'll meet you outside the Netflix studio, alone he drove himself i drove and i had one cameraman that's it that's so awesome he held the mic when i was talking and i held it for him and that's, uh, respect. that's respect yeah and it's typical of guillermo that's who he is and then the yeah. same with gareth edwards i mean same with everybody I, yeah. I, I interviewed and they're talking about the philosophy and the impact and everything gareth edwards is throughout the whole documentary when it eventually would get it out giving his opinion on on everything and he's really kind of um he he gave a kind of platform for me to structure the documentary around him and guillermo guillermo is very erudite he, he's very interesting in his opinions of you know the saga and what what who luke skywalker is basically is a perfect hero's journey yeah yeah. And by the way, guys, everyone watching us, um, we got a chance to, to see the, the documentary and yes. it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, the stories that are in there, if anybody has a chance to, to go watch it, I'll, I'll put as much information um, in the link of this YouTube video. That's so a great idea. I hope that works out for you, Roger. Yeah, I hope so. Because you deserve that. Well, it. yeah, so does every fan. You know, That's I made right. it for the fans because uh, um, yes. they, they want to know all this stuff and it will be studied and, and there isn't anyone else to tell the stories. Yeah. So, Nobody. Speaking of stories, I mean, what 
in this picture, I mean, look at these legends right here. And especially, look at that guy on the left over there. With <laughs> you, straight out of Led Zeppelin. Yeah, well, <laughs> there's an excuse why I'm, you know, I, I, I kept long hair at the thing. Yeah. But when we got back to the studio, it was the hottest summer on record. And we were in Britain. There's no air conditioning. Mm, they didn't yeah. even know what it was. It was swelteringly hot. Mm. So I was the only way I could do was under my shirt, and I was trying to keep cool. Mm. Um, yeah, everyone else says that. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to be rude and ask your age, but I will tell you this, that you look fantastic. I, I mean, it's hard to believe that you were part of the first era of Star Wars, the way you look. I mean, you seem very, I mean, yeah. yeah, well, I've kept that's on purpose. And I, I have eaten healthily. I've been healthy all my life, and I learned about organic foods when I was young and stuff. So gotcha. that makes a huge difference in your oh, life. Yeah. And also, it's you know, artists. Look at look at um, uh, any of the great artists. They they lived a very long time, and you're fulfilled, and you you keep going. You keep your mind going, and everything. And I think it's very important. This. So I've yeah. got another book I'm just finishing now called We Can All Be Heroes. Oh, okay. And um, that's a self-help book on how Luke Skywalker's journey evolved and the, the myth behind it and my journey in the past and what I'd been through because I went through very similar things to Luke, funny enough. So wow. it's a kind of self-help book for everybody to find themselves and happiness and everything and you know that's i tell stories and everyone said you've got to write this so i finished that now so now i'm chasing a publisher to get that out somehow or an ebook yeah hey, roger that's fantastic i love that it's, i mean that, and that's the thing like with with all these and i want to show some some pictures of kind of some of your you know obviously some praises that you've had you know obviously you're an oscar winner right i mean you've you've definitely been acknowledged for the work that you've done. And I know the fans appreciate everything that you've done and, and want to hear these stories and want to hear your perspective on it. So, uh, yeah. And, the, and they're mentoring books, you know, the last line in my books and I'm an alchemist is don't let anyone tell you, you can't, you can. Yeah. Yeah. So so I wrote it with that perspective that anyone should follow their instinct and follow, you know, and, and our job is to make our instinct work because most people, the instinct is buried just because of childhood and peers and parents and schooling and growing up. Everything gets buried who we are. So you've got to find that and find that. That's where happiness is. And that's the hero's journey. That's Luke Skywalker's journey from a mm -hmm. farm hand on a planet to being a yeah. Jedi master. Yeah, yeah. there's a big connection between Star Wars and real life. Yes. Yeah, right. it's, and that's why it's, there's no other film has penetrated the planet, you know, and it's now, I think, next to the Bible, it's the most known word, Star Wars, in the world. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, it's very important to follow instinct yes. and also yeah. your, your passion. Yeah, and you know, we're all told not to. I mean, I was told not to. My father ordered me to be a priest, a doctor, or an architect. Yeah, that was it. There was no going back on that. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Roger, I mean, people could obviously pick up your book, right? Uh, currently, right? Cinema. Yeah, uh, that's on Amazon still. That's that's yeah. and um, that's there, and the people seem to like it. So, I'm happy. Yeah. I'm so glad you did that. And just briefly, I want to talk about obviously you besides Star Wars. You know, you you worked on Alien. You got Oscar. Um, for the art direction, right? For Alien. Yeah, we got a yes. nomination, yes. Yeah. And um, did, did you have the chance to meet the artist uh, Giga in person? No, I work with him every day. Oh, you did? Um, <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. I, when I met him, because I went down, because I was the art director, the, the set deck on it, Ian Whitaker was a great friend of mine, but he did like, um, he did, beautiful period films he got an oscar for howard's end films like that when i arrived because i came late because i was on life of brian and i couldn't go on to alien and then life of brian collapsed um and the same day it collapsed ridley called me and said get down here i need you and um 
he came running up to me and said, oh my God, thank God you're here. I don't know anything about this science fiction and scrap and doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, then when Giga came, so I went down to the stage. They, they built him a little cabin inside one of the stages. And I went down and said, HR, tell me what you need. He said, I want bones. <laughs> and I said, sure, I'll get you. Tell me what you want. And uh, I knew where to get bones from because on film industry, there are special sterilized way of doing it because it's anthrax. They're dangerous. So I knew I got him a whole truckload of bones. Real, Real bones. bones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he sculpted the sets in miniature mm. using these bones. No, no one else would go in there. They were all frightened of them. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, I, and we had lunch with him every day, and Mia, his girlfriend, in, in the pub in Shepparton. And I was the translator for things like, um, yeah. what is yeah. this, toad in the hole? Yeah. So I said, yeah. sausages in batter. And then he, he said, what is this spotted dick? And <laughs> it's a pudding. It's a famous British pudding that's, that's kind of um, got yeah. currants in it and stuff. <laughs> it was funny. We, we used to laugh with it. Yeah. But he yeah, went, I was with him every day. He was from Genius. Austria, right? Huh? He was from Austria? He's, um, yeah, Austria. Austrian. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, he spoke German, right? right? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's a German part of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, he, his girlfriend Mia spoke perfect English. She would help to translate, mm -hmm. but, um, he just worked and he, you know, all of those sets he built in miniature first and then like with the alien planet, when they go to see it, he was even spray painting that uh, once the painters had done, he was in there with big spray painting okay. units and spraying and everything. He was really involved in the whole thing. What a great artist. Oh, I think there's also a bar in Austria that is completely designed uh, with the alien look, right? Yes. Yeah. Every totally. building. No, I haven't seen the, the, that part of the museum. I've been to Austria a lot, but not there. Wow. I'd like to go, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Funny stories about him, but that would be for another time. <laughs> well, like I said, Roger, like, I mean, I, I love this this picture going back and forth on it, right? Like seeing you guys kind of, you know, behind yeah, the and before. It, it puts it in perspective. If you watch the, the film of the Academy Awards, and we were shocked. I mean, we didn't expect it. It's science fiction. We thought this. We haven't got a ch heart to hope in hell. Um, and the special effects boys got theirs first, and they were dancing and thanking dogs and all this stuff. And then we just said, "John, you say something." Yeah. And John just took the Oscar and said, "You know, every single frame in this film belongs to this one man down there, and that's George Lucas." I'm um, yeah because he wasn't nominated, nothing. And that was typical of John as well. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, you have a high respect for him, Roger, uh, John, and I think that's fantastic. Yeah, and so does George. When we were on Phantom Menace one day in the shoot, and, and he came to look at something that I was doing, and we were walking across one of the big empty stages at Leavesden, and then George suddenly stopped and said, Roger, I really miss John Barry. And I said, I know. And he said that because John was so supportive to him. He brought so much to that first film that made it work without ever complaining, nothing. He, he helped to overcome the impossibilities of making that film. We had $4 right. million dollars when it started. Um, it was impossible to do, but John, John, respected what George was doing and, and really liked him. We, we got on well together. Um, and I think it, it, he played such a major part in actually Star Wars seeing the light of day because I don't think it would. So it really, I've got to end soon because of my son's. Well, yeah, no. Hey, but, start. Um, yeah, for Ralph sure. Ralph McCorry, I mentioned earlier. Yeah. So Ralph, um, I don't know if you know this story. Ralph then realized, okay, this is what they want, a map painting. And he understood how to do it, and he had to do it on glass. 
he didn't have any glass, so he, he took the shower door off <laughs> yeah. and, and painted that part of the hold and the Millennium Falcon on the shower door. Wow. But then, because Paul Bateman is a mate of mine and Paul's in the documentary, and he's he inherited kind of being Ralph Macquarie. He knew Ralph, he did his website, and um, and he said, then you don't know what he did. He had an old car and he realized it had to go to San Francisco. He said he tied his shower door onto the top of this old car and drove it up to San Francisco. Yeah. I, they kind of, to me, sum up how this film was made, you know, in practical stories. Roger, are you in touch with George today? Have you, has it been a while? I, I last saw him. Uh, my wife was pregnant, so he's nine. So we went to the ranch. Um, they were showing Black Angel. They restored it, and it showed in the in the Mill Valley Film Festival. Hmm. So I went up to the ranch um, and had lunch with George. I'm one of the few people who still can because I've never abused my friendship or um, For sure. I, I've only been 100% positive about him and his legacy and what he's given the world and. Uh, and I happy. That's why I do these. I'm happy to keep talking about it. And you know, there, there's so much derogatory stuff flies at George and everything. It's mm -hmm. the man. The man has done a gift, given a gift to this planet that I think only maybe in the future it'll be seen how much he's given to children. Yeah. Um, so we had lunch, and just to tell you, the lunch he had. His daughter then um, was just born. She was, I don't know, about nine months old. The whole conversation at lunch was over nappies, that how now, diapers you call them, sorry. Yeah. But how great it was now because you had a, a stripe and it would, if it was yellow, it would turn blue. Before yeah. in the old days, you had to stick your finger in <laughs> and feel if it's wet. <laughs> well, he didn't have time back in the day. No. I think it's awesome. Yeah, and baby food and all this stuff. And then I, I did go to see with him. He was um, digitizing the movies. Yeah. And he said, look at this. From the first movie, when it's digitized, he said, all the gaffer tape holding together Darth uh, um, Vader, uh -huh. you could see all the gaffer tape on C-3PO. <laughs> there was gold tape stucking him together because the first day of filming was the first time he ever put that costume on fully. Yeah. Um, and it all showed up, so he had to go in and CGI three quarters of the movie just to get rid of all this oh, stuff that did. never showed up on film. Wow. Yeah, we, we spoke a lot, and I spoke to him about Black Angel and, and what I was trying to do with it, because in the end, his commission made that happen, and so he gave me a lot of very sound advice. And they'd done the, the um, sound mix, they re mixed it after it was re-digitized and everything for me yeah. yeah so you know he's he's um hasn't changed really at the end of the day his one passion is his family and that's overriding everything even star wars that's what's important in life you know yeah so, it is yeah so but yeah roger i i mean we definitely we want to you don't hold you up any longer. We we appreciate you so much coming on here and not at all. It's fun. Oh, you guys so are doing great stuff, and I look at your sets and the miniatures and everything. It's it's um, <laughs> wow. I, I just smile. The set. <laughs> yeah, when I, I see one of them, I yeah. smile. You know. Yeah, and and again, I think and I I think I say this for you know on behalf of us and all our watchers and all our followers that truly, truly, your work did change our childhood uh, us as as grown it did affect us it star wars is something that has literally changed our mm. lives and and yeah. sure all our watchers will right. agree that it's something that you know it's hard to describe the connection that we have to it because of how real it is because of the experiences that we've had through life you know that's attached to star wars and again for for having you be part of it and being able to chat with you yes. and hear these stories is a true honor and again appreciate yeah thank you i mean it's it's you know i'm even here now i'm doing the the local kind of because they never got a chance but there's a i just did a one called may the north be with you it was a two-day okay. and yeah. 
I did a retro con. I've been doing them here. I used to do the American. I, once I get invited back, I'll go down and do those again. But I was doing these here, and you know, I meet so many people, and I so many people have been in tears just when we're talking about stuff, and I'm very kind of sensitive to it and what. As I said, and that's why I wrote this book about We Can All Be Heroes, because I realized it gave people who had no hope, in a way, something to believe in. And this is really important to people. So, you know, you hear people say, oh, fans, they should go and do this and that, and get life and everything. No, I, I'm very, you know, appreciative of them telling me their stories. Um, the TVX Sabres, I don't know if you know them, they make beautiful lightsabers. And um, I had to autograph his one, the replica of mine, and he was literally in tears. They filmed it while I was doing it. Um, and you realize then that the impact that George has brought the world, basically, it's him. He's the creator. Um, and he fought, as you said at the beginning, I mean, it put him in hospital. They thought he was having a heart attack. It was stress. Yeah. Just pulling this film through with so much against him, everybody, mm -hmm. um, he did it, and he pulled it through, and it worked, and he had a vision for the world. And he's always said to me, I make my film for nine years old. That's what no one understands, and it's not my fault that adults like them as well. <laughs> yeah. True. Which yeah. is true, yeah. you know. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I want to close out by saying to Jens, thank you for bringing the connection with Roger Christian on Collection Wars. Um, Jens, obviously, with Legacy of Arts yes. and also editor of Journal of the Wills. You do a great job on your editing side. Thank you. Roger, you know, I've said it many times on our channel that um, Star Wars is a miracle. It's a miracle because it brings it, it brought together a huge group of such talented many of you guys not even knowing the talent that was involved that created something so iconic and almost 45 getting into 50 years later it's not slowing down and no no it's it, growing i mean yes. i have a nine-year-old who's you know, just obsessed with it, doing drawings and everything and i never told him what i did he only started to find out and then Mm -hmm. I took him to the Retrocon the first time he went, and he was in heaven. He just landed in heaven. There was, there was props and things for sale and Pokemon stands and everything, and uh, he got a what lightsaber. A lucky, what a lucky kid. I can imagine the He's stories a, <laughs> he gets to hear, the cool <laughs> stuff. Does, you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, he made me a beautiful lightsaber out of Lego. Oh, um, that's very which cool. Which is you a like treasure, that? yeah. Yeah, there's... Not many nine-year-olds have a dad that has the knowledge <laughs> in the background that his dad has. And it's, yeah. it's really cool that you were able to share a lot of those stories. And, and uh, I'm glad to be able to call you friend now, Roger. Yeah. And, uh, I look forward to, uh, you know, talks in the future and, and yes. be able to tell you what you are absolutely yeah, yeah. welcome. Anytime. On. Yes. Anytime. It's we, all, we uh, yeah, I'm very open about this stuff and I'm very it happy to do it. And I'm very happy to share the stories and it. You know, I want people to know this isn't like, you know, kids now see a huge Hollywood blockbuster Star Wars films, but it started with a ragtag group of kind of yeah. broken revolutionaries who tried to find a way to do something that had never yes. been done and, and just stuck to our instinct and our belief and friendship with George. That's yeah. right. It was important. Yeah. I still think somebody should have walked up and punched the DP in the mouth, but that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> It it <laughs> nearly happened, yeah. yeah. They should have done. I just oh, slapped this. But sad. anyways, yeah, for yeah. Sure. There we are. He's the only one who didn't get an Oscar, mind you. Well, yeah. there you go. Oh, I was gonna say. I wonder what that was like. Yeah, I thought Lucas was like hmm. <laughs> karma. Yeah, exactly. yeah. George just won't talk about it. He yeah, goes, that's because he's classy that way. Yeah, and he just goes red with anger if his name is or the or the or the. Um, Mm -hmm. special effects designer either of their names are mentioned he goes red oh, i can okay. see underneath the surface but he yeah. that's it then he just gets on with work yeah there well, we are thank, thank you for what you do cool. Roger. 
Not yeah. at all. And it's nice to meet you all. Yeah. Yes. I regard you all as friends now. So that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Roger. And and like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna be sending you stuff uh, through email. So cool. cool stuff yeah. that the fans are making. Please, yeah. Lots of work that's you know obviously paying tribute to a lot of the stuff that you're, you're yeah. doing. So and also we wanna have you in the German Star Wars magazine. Yes. Oh yes. Yes. Anytime. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's I've good. always done really well. Nostradamus, my movie that I made, yeah. it played in cinemas in Germany for 16 weeks. It was the oh, biggest wow. hit Congrats. anywhere. Yeah, it was huge in Germany. And I still now is I'm recognized in Germany because of Nostradamus. That is great. Yeah. I yeah. went there. We had such an amazing time with the journalists, everybody. Wow. They understood it. You know. Yeah. I look forward to seeing your $25,000 budgeted film. So. Yeah, short ends and, and, you know, that's, but when I learned, we went into the rank studios and the guy who did the color timing for Kubrick, yeah. I said, I don't know what you're going to do, the special effects negative and all of this stuff. He balanced it all out and no one had ever shot Scotland. I was trying to be Kurosawa mm. and he used Mount Fuji as part of his drama. I had never seen Scotland ever filmed in this mystical beauty and that's yeah. what we went after. The DP it was the first job he'd ever done, and ever he he made one little film on how a washing machine worked, <laughs> and um, the first day I could see him puzzling. He had a light meter, and I said, "What's up?" And he said, "I can't get a reading. There's no light here." And he said, "But look through camera. It looks amazing." And he threw the lightsaber over his shoulder and said, "That's yeah. it. We're just going to make it." And we did. <laughs> and see, and if I'd got an established DP, I wouldn't have shot the film. He would have said, right. no, we're not shooting today. Exactly. I think I inherited that from George. If you look at it, like Joe Johnson was a surfer. He didn't even know what the job entailed. He needed a job. <laughs> and Richard Edland and, and Dykstra, we were all, if you look at through the history, even the posters, mm -hmm. we were all very young. We'd mm -hmm. done work that was different. I'd, I'd made very interesting movies in, in England, but we were unjaded. Mm -hmm. We only had enough experience to get it, but most people like special effects. If you get to a certain point, you go, no, Gov, that's not how you do it. This is how we've always done it. Not nobody. George wrote in every film what had never could not be done right. and realized that who he hired would figure it out, yeah. how to do it. Wow. And I think that's part of George's genius. He, he saw that instinct again. He saw an instinct in all the people across the board mm. who could do something um, and get it done. And that was the few kind of creatives that he chose. I love his, I love his saying, Roger. Well, think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Did he ever tell you to think about it? Because now I tell all my subs and my, I'm a G7 build, buildings and stuff. And I tell people and they're like, I don't know. I'm like, We'll think about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> they never is, do. Yeah. They never do. We use <laughs> yeah, I know. But he had that thing. Yes. Think about it. Was basically saying, ah, you, you know, just yeah, you'll it. find a way. He yeah. hasn't told you what to do. You see, yes. he just yes. said, "This is what I want." He knew what he wanted, but he didn't know how to actually do it. You're right. And people did it. Yeah. There we are. Well, Roger, right. great show. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Sure. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be in touch. We'll yeah, keep in touch. I'm, I'm link. We'll send you a easy link. About it. Okay. And, well, uh, send me a link of this because I, I want to blast it out and get people to watch. Appreciate and to, that. Yeah, to our Star Wars community, thanks so much for your support and what a great episode. Yeah, it was nice to meet you all. Yes. You can meet you all. all right. right. Okay, Thank I'm you. now going to go and rescue my <laughs> son Have from a good his day. iPad. No, he's be on the iPad like, in heaven. Oh, the the longer yeah. I'm here, you know, I don't have to go to sleep. Yeah. Oh, I have an uh, eight-year-old, so Tracy, uh, yeah. she's same thing. <laughs> this have iPad is, is more taken away and hidden than anything else in this house, but he finds it and he's back on it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but he's learning a lot. Good night, everybody. Thank Have you a great so much. Night. Bye. Night, Gabe. Thank you. Bye, Roger. Bye. Bye. Ciao.